Welcome to the Quick Pro Camera Guide for the Nikon D5200. This is a great camera that will capture amazing images as well as HD video. We hope you'll enjoy learning more about it with this guide. This guide is meant to be a study tool to be used in connection with and not a replacement of your camera's owner's manual. You can watch it entirely in one sitting or by chapter. The functions and features of the D5200 that we cover are designed to give you a solid working knowledge of your camera. It's really not possible to cover every configuration on your camera, but we will provide you a very solid foundation to build your digital photography skills on. With this new information, you'll be able to improve your ability to capture great pictures in a variety of shooting settings. The D5200 has an impressive 24 megapixel image sensor, a fully articulated LCD screen, a 39 point autofocus system, effects modes, an HDR setting, and many other great features and functions that we'll discuss in this guide. Let's get started. Your D5200 has many sophisticated buttons and dials, and to take the best pictures with your camera, you'll want to be familiar with the functions of each of them. Let's begin by taking a closer look at many of the camera's features. First, there is the power switch and shutter release button. To take a picture, simply press and hold the shutter button halfway down for a moment, allow the camera to focus, and press it the rest of the way down to take the picture. This is the movie record button, the exposure compensation button, and the information button. This is the release mode button. To set a release mode, press the release mode button and use the multi-selector to make your selection. You can choose from single frame, continuous low speed, continuous high speed, self timer, delayed remote, quick response remote, and quiet. This is the mode dial. It has four sections, each with different options and benefits. This section contains the camera's auto modes. In these modes, the camera will do all the work for you. All you have to do is point and shoot. These are the scene modes. Here you can choose from five different scene modes on the dial itself and 11 more within the scene setting. These modes can help you quickly capture great pictures when you're in specific shooting scenarios. The effects modes allow you to create one of seven creative special effects with your images. And these are the PSA and M modes, the manual modes that allow you to take the most control over exposure, depth of field, and motion blur. We'll discuss more about the various modes on the D5200 later in this guide. This is the live view switch. Rotating the switch will allow you to enter or exit the camera's live view shooting mode. Here is the accessory shoe, which will allow you to use an optional flash unit with your camera. This is the built-in flash unit. This is the stereo microphone that records sound in the camera's movie mode. Take care not to cover the microphone when movie recording. On this side of the camera, we'll find the SD memory card slot cover. When you're inserting a memory card, you'll want to make sure that the manufacturer's logo is facing the back of the camera. Simply insert the card until it clicks into place and close the card slot cover. Before you start taking pictures with a new memory card, it's a good idea to format it. Also keep in mind that your camera will operate faster if you periodically format the memory card rather than simply deleting images from it to free up space for more picture taking. Make sure that you don't format your card unless you have already copied the images that you want to save to your computer. Formatting your card will erase all the images. To format the SD memory card, press the menu button and use the camera's multi-selector to navigate to the setup menu, indicated by the wrench icon. Use the multi-selector to select the format memory card option and press OK. Select Yes and press OK. Now let's take a look at the other side of the camera. Here there is the connector cover, which will allow you to connect the camera to other devices. This is the microphone connector, which will allow you to connect an external microphone for movie recording. Here is the USB and AV connector, which will allow you to connect the camera to a computer, compatible printer, or TV. This is the accessory connector, which will allow you to connect the camera to optional accessories, including a GPS unit. This is the HDMI connector, where you can connect the camera to an HD television. Also on this side of the camera, there is the flash button, 
which can be used in conjunction with the command dial to select the flash mode and flash compensation. This is the function button. You can use the custom setting menu to customize this button to provide quick access to many of the camera settings. This is the lens release button. To attach a lens, make sure that the camera is switched to off. Hold the camera with one hand and the lens with the other like this. Align the lens's index with the camera's index, then gently rotate the lens until it clicks into place. Take great care not to scratch the lens by allowing it to make contact with anything. When you want to remove a lens, press the lens release button while holding the camera with the same hand. Then, with the other hand, rotate the lens until it uncouples. Avoid changing lenses in windy or dusty conditions. This will help the image sensor stay clean and free of dust. This is the AF Assist Illuminator. In low light conditions, this will illuminate the scene to help the camera find focus. This is the infrared receiver, which allows the camera to communicate with an optional remote control. Now let's take a look at the back of the camera. The most prominent feature is the fully articulated 3-inch LCD screen. When rotating or tilting the LCD monitor, note that it will pivot, tilt, and rotate in specific directions, and forcing the monitor in a direction other than intended may cause damage. This screen serves several purposes. First, it displays images that have been taken. Using the camera's multi-selector, you can scroll through the images on the memory card. Second, when the mode dial is rotated or the shutter button is pressed, the LCD monitor provides fast and easy access to the camera's shooting settings in the information display. Third, when the menu button is pressed, the LCD monitor displays the camera's menu system, where you can change many important settings in the camera. And fourth, when the live view switch is rotated, the LCD monitor provides a real-time view of the scene. Directly above the LCD monitor is the viewfinder, where you can see camera settings when you're taking pictures. Before you start taking pictures, you'll want to focus the viewfinder. To do this, use the diopter adjustment control located to the right of the eye cup. Rotate the control until the automatic focus points in the viewfinder are in sharp focus. At the bottom of the viewfinder display, you can see the focus indicator, the shutter speed, aperture, the number of shots remaining, and when the flash is being used, the flash ready indicator. Over the scene, you will see the camera's focus points. When the shutter button is pressed halfway to focus, the area where the focus points blink in red will be in focus. This is the information edit button. When the information display is shown in the LCD monitor, pressing this button will allow you to quickly change many of the camera's shooting settings. This is the shooting mode, the release mode, the beep indicator, and the battery indicator. This is the shutter speed display, the aperture display, and the ISO display. This is the autofocus area indicator and the number of shots remaining. Below the graphic display, you can see all of the settings that you can quickly access and adjust. First, there is the image quality setting, the image size, the bracketing setting, the HDR setting, the active delighting setting, the white balance setting, the ISO sensitivity, the picture control, the focus mode, the autofocus area mode, the metering mode, the flash mode, the flash compensation, and the exposure compensation. This is the help icon. When this icon is displayed, you can press the help button to view information about the currently selected option. This is the AEL-AFL protect button. The AEL is for auto exposure lock. When you're using the center weighted or spot metering modes, pressing and holding this button will lock the exposure while you recompose the image. The AFL is for auto focus lock. Pressing and holding this button will lock the focus while you recompose the image. The final purpose for this button is to protect images from accidental deletion. We'll talk more about this function later in the guide. Here is the command dial. Rotating this dial allows you to change exposure settings as well as many other camera settings. This is the playback button. Pressing this button will allow you to view your images on the LCD monitor. As we've discussed, this is the multi-selector. This is used for navigating the menu system, scrolling through images in playback, and accessing information in the information display. In the center of the multi-selector is the OK button. 
Press this button to confirm your selections in the information display and menu systems. These are the playback zoom in and playback zoom out buttons. The playback zoom out button also functions as the help button. This is the delete button, which allows you to delete photos from the memory card. Your D5200 has a variety of image area, quality, and size settings that will allow you to capture images with resolution, file format, and compression that you need for your scenario. Let's first take a minute to talk about the camera's image quality and image size options. Your Nikon D5200 can record image files in two different image quality settings or file types, RAW and JPEG. First, there is the RAW or NEF setting. RAW files are not actually image files. They are actually the RAW data saved to the memory card directly from the image sensor. This means that RAW must be processed on the computer before they are printed. Next, RAW file sizes are considerably larger than JPEG files. RAW files have a much broader range of tones. Shadow and highlight areas have more detail than other image files, and you can extensively edit RAW files without losing image data. The other image quality setting on the D5200 is JPEG. JPEG files are a standard compressed file format that is supported by any image software. Because JPEG files are compressed, the file sizes are very small compared to RAW files, but they also have a much narrower range of tones and will lose some image data each time they're saved. Let's take a look at how to select the image quality settings on the D5200. With the information display active on the LCD, we'll press the information edit button and use the multi-selector to navigate to the image quality and size options. We'll press OK to see the options and make changes. There are four RAW options, including RAW plus fine JPEG, meaning that each time a photo is taken, two files will be saved, one RAW and one fine quality JPEG. You can also choose RAW plus normal JPEG or RAW plus basic JPEG. The final RAW option will simply save the RAW file with no JPEG. The JPEG options include fine, normal, and basic. The JPEG image quality options determine how much compression will be used when the JPEG file is saved to the memory card. Images with a fine setting will have the least compression and the highest quality. Images with a normal setting will have moderate compression, and images with a basic setting will have the most compression and the lowest quality. Now let's talk about the image size options. This is where you choose how many megapixels you'd like the camera to use when recording images. The first image size option is large. Choosing this setting will use all 24 megapixels. The medium option uses about 13 megapixels and the small option uses about 6 megapixels. You might choose the medium or small size options if you are only using the photos for emailing or posting online, but most of the time you will probably want to use the large option. Now that we've discussed image quality and file types, we'll talk a little about how to archive and back up these files for future use and safekeeping. It's important to have your files saved in at least two different locations. There are many ways you can back up your files, and we'll discuss a few of them here, including CDs and DVDs, external and redundant hard drive systems, and online backup services. Regardless of which methods of backup you choose, you'll want to have a regular system for backing up your files. It's a good idea to create backups at the same time as you download the files from the camera's memory card for post-processing. Remember to create backups in two different locations in addition to your regular working hard drive. You'll also want to create backups of your processed images at set times each day, week, or month depending on how frequently you're updating or adding to files on your computer. The most affordable way to create a backup of your files is to burn them to CDs or DVDs. It is also a good idea to make multiple copies of each CD or DVD as well as have at least one additional backup method. There are a few things to know about using CDs or DVDs to archive your images. Although the topic is debatable, our research found that many low-quality writable CDs or DVDs 
have an average lifespan of about 15 years when properly stored and cared for. If you choose to use these discs, you'll want to make sure that you not only have multiple backups of each disc, but you'll also want to periodically check the discs for signs of deterioration or discoloration. There are several companies that use gold and silver in the manufacture of their discs to ensure archival quality. These discs are more costly than their lower quality counterparts, but they will normally have a lifespan of anywhere from 100 to 300 years. Be sure to look for the manufacturer's guarantee when shopping for silver or gold CDs or DVDs. Although these discs are more archival, you'll still want to make sure that you have multiple copies of each disc. Regardless of which type of CD or DVD that you use to back up your image files, you'll want to follow a few simple rules to help your discs last as long as possible. First, always check the disc to verify that the contents have been successfully recorded before placing it into storage. Always handle the discs with care using only the outer edges or center hole. Also, use only non-solvent permanent marker on the disc and only write on the inner hub area. Finally, you also want to make sure that the discs are stored upright in jewel cases or paper sleeves in a cool, dry place. In addition to having a CD or DVD backup of your files, it's also a good idea to have the files saved using another method. External hard drives have become increasingly affordable and are available in a variety of capacities. When you use an external hard drive for backup purposes, you'll want to use a different hard drive for everyday working use to preserve the integrity of the backup drive. Another option for backing up your image files is a redundant hard drive or RAID system. These systems vary in size, speed, and cost, but can be an effective backup method. Let's take a look at how these systems work. Inside this box, there are two drives. Some systems have two hard drives, others have four or more. Each of the hard drives hold the same exact data. This way, when one of the drives fails, the other drive will still have all of the data and the bad drive can easily be replaced and repopulated with the data from the good drive. The system is connected to a computer using a standard USB cable or through a network. Some of these systems are very user-friendly and easy to install. Others may require the assistance of your local computer service technician. Again, it's a good idea to have these files saved using at least one additional method. Another way to keep a backup of your files is through an online backup service. These services vary not only in cost, but in the way that the backups are managed. Most of these services will require that you install a piece of software on your computer. At a set time each day, week, or month, the software will back up your files via the internet on a remote server. One of the advantages of using an online backup service is that in case of a fire or other natural disaster, your files will be safe at an off-site location. Many photographers keep external hard drives, CDs, or DVDs in addition to using an online backup service. One of the most important concepts in photography is exposure, or the amount of light that falls on the camera's image sensor or film. A properly exposed photo will have good detail in the shadow, mid-tone, and highlight areas. Photos that are too bright are overexposed, and photos that are too dark are underexposed. There are three ways that your D5200 measures light. These are the camera's metering modes. To select a metering mode, first make sure that the information display is active on the LCD. Then press the Information Edit button and navigate to the Metering Mode option. Here, you can choose from matrix, center-weighted, or spot metering. The first metering mode is called matrix metering. This is a great general-use metering mode that can be used in most shooting scenarios. The camera sets the exposure automatically to suit the scene. This is a good mode to use for many situations, but sometimes when the scene is very bright or very dark, you may want to use a different metering mode. The next mode is center-weighted metering. This is a classic metering mode used for portraits. Center-weighted metering will evaluate the entire frame and assign the greatest weight to the center area. The last metering mode is spot metering. This is a great mode to use when there is a lot of contrast between the background and the subject. 
when the background is either very bright or very dark. This metering mode will meter off the selected focus point unless the focus point selection is set to auto, in which case the metering will be determined based on the center focus point. Now that you know a little about how your camera sees and measures light to create properly exposed photos, let's talk a little about the shooting modes on your D5200. Your camera features a variety of shooting modes, ranging from fully automatic to completely manual. This gives you a lot of flexibility and creative control over your photos. You can adjust the exposure, shutter speed, and depth of field settings on your camera to help you capture the pictures you want. As you become more familiar with these concepts and principles, you'll improve your ability to capture the best pictures possible. To select a shooting mode, simply rotate the mode dial. This section of the mode dial contains the auto modes for your camera. These modes are auto and flash off. When shooting in these modes, all you'll have to do is point and shoot. The camera will do all the work for you. The D5200 has six different options for scene modes on the mode dial. Let's discuss a little about each of them. First, there is the scene option. When this mode is selected, you will have the ability to quickly choose the scene mode you'd like by rotating the command dial. The options are shown on the information display and include night portrait, night landscape, party indoor, beach snow, sunset, dusk dawn, pet portrait, candlelight, blossom, autumn colors, and food. The next scene mode option on the mode dial is the portrait mode. To shoot in this mode, simply rotate the mode dial to portrait. Use this mode when you want the subject to be in focus and what is behind the subject to have a soft focus. In portrait mode, the aperture is set wide open. The aperture is controlled inside the lens, and an open aperture indicates that the lens will let all the light it can into the shutter. With a wide aperture, you'll get a shallow depth of field. The next mode is landscape mode. In this mode, the aperture will have a very narrow opening, creating a very long depth of field. The camera will then adjust the shutter speed to get the proper exposure. This mode will give your photo a sharp focus in both the foreground and the background. With the landscape mode, the shutter speed can get pretty slow, so be sure to steady your camera or use a tripod to avoid camera shake. The next mode is the child mode. This shooting mode is great for snapshots of children. The camera will capture bright and vivid colors, but keep skin tones natural. To capture fast-moving subjects, select the sports mode. When the sports mode is used, the camera will set a fast shutter speed to help freeze the action. A telephoto or long lens helps you get closer to the action and gives you a great range of focal length options. The last scene mode is the close-up mode. This shooting mode is great for capturing flowers and other small objects that are physically close to the camera lens. This mode tells the camera to use a large aperture opening to provide a shallow depth of field. Use this at the lens's minimum focusing distance. The D5200 also features a unique effects mode where you can take photos with a variety of special effects. To use these special effects, rotate the mode dial to effects. The seven different options are shown on the information display and can be selected simply by rotating the command dial. Let's briefly discuss each of these modes. First, there is the night vision effects mode. This mode is useful when you want to take photos in the dark with very high ISOs. Select this mode by rotating the command dial. To autofocus, the camera must be set to live view. Images taken in this mode are black and white and have digital noise. You may want to use a tripod to reduce image blur. The next effects mode is the color sketch mode. With this mode, you can take creative photos with only the color outlines of the object in the image visible. Again, simply rotate the command dial to select this mode. The next effects mode is the miniature effect. Using this mode, you can make distant subjects appear to be very small. To take a photo with the miniature effect, you'll need to be using Live View. Here, you can use the multi-selector to choose a focus point. Next, press OK to view the options for the miniature effect. 
You can choose to have the in-focus area of the image be wide or narrow, and you can choose to have it be horizontal or vertical in the frame. Press OK when you're finished making your selections. Now simply take the picture. Next, there is the selective color mode. In this mode, you can select only one color to be visible in the image and the other colors to be black and white. To use this mode, make sure that the mode dial is set to effects and rotate the command dial until the selective color is shown on the information display. Now you'll need to choose the color we want to have visible in the image using the camera's live view. Enter live view by rotating the live view switch. Press the OK button to display the selective color options. Place the colored object within the small white frame and press the up arrow on the multi-selector to choose that color. Now, using the up and down arrows on the multi-selector, you can adjust the range of hues that you'd like the camera to include. You can choose from levels 1 through 7. If you choose 1, there will be a narrower range of colors shown in the final image. If you choose 7, there will be a broader range of colors. When you're finished making adjustments, press OK. Now take the picture. Only the color that you have selected will be shown in the image, and everything else will be black and white. The next effects mode is Silhouette. This is a great mode to use outdoors at sunset when you'd like to capture a silhouette of your subject. With the information display shown on the LCD, rotate the command dial until Silhouette is selected. Now simply compose your shot and take the picture. The next effects mode is High Key. You can use this mode when you're taking pictures of a scene that is very bright. The High Key mode makes images appear to be filled with light. The last effects mode is low key. With this mode, the camera will capture dark images and retain prominent highlights. Now that we've talked about the more basic shooting modes, let's discuss the camera's P, S, A, and M modes. Note that we'll learn about these modes, but we won't spend very much time discussing basic photography concepts. If you'd like to learn more about how to use the camera's PSA and M modes to take amazing photos, you may benefit from Quick Pro's Fundamentals series, which covers important elements of photography, including exposure, basic lighting, and composition. These are modes that allow you to take the most creative control over the camera's settings, like aperture, shutter speed, ISO, white balance, flash, as well as a variety of other settings. This section of the mode dial has the P, S, A, and M modes. These modes include P or programmed auto, S or shutter priority, A or aperture priority, and M or manual. The first mode is called programmed auto and is represented with a P on the mode dial. In this mode, the camera automatically adjusts shutter speed and aperture for optimal exposure. This may seem similar to the auto modes, but with the P mode, you have control over the camera's aperture, shutter speed, focus mode, release mode, and built-in flash settings. To operate in this mode, rotate the mode dial to P, press the shutter button halfway down to activate the viewfinder. To monitor the aperture and exposure settings, look through the viewfinder, hold the shutter button halfway down to focus, and then press the shutter button all the way down to take the picture. You may find that the shutter speed is too slow for what you're photographing or that the aperture does not give you the depth of field that you're looking for. If you'd like to change the camera's shutter speed and aperture combination, simply rotate the command dial. Rotate the command dial to the right for large apertures and fast shutter speeds and rotate the command dial to the left for small apertures and slow shutter speeds. The next setting on the mode dial is the S or shutter priority mode. The shutter priority mode is useful for times when you want to control motion in the scene, whether it's freezing action or blurring the motion of the subject. In this mode, you'll set the shutter speed and the camera will automatically select the appropriate aperture value for proper exposure. To use the camera in shutter priority mode, set the mode dial to S. Hold the shutter button down halfway to allow the camera to focus and rotate the command dial to set the shutter speed. The Nikon D5200 has shutter speeds that range from very slow, 30 full seconds, to very fast, 1 4,000th of a second. You can view the shutter speed and aperture values through the camera's viewfinder or the information display. The next setting on the mode dial is the A or aperture priority mode. 
The aperture priority mode is useful for times when you want to control the depth of field in an image. Depth of field is the term used to describe the distance between the nearest and farthest objects in the scene that appear acceptably sharp in an image. When only a small area of the subject in an image is in focus, it's said to have a shallow depth of field. This effect is achieved by using a smaller f-stop number. When everything in both the foreground and the background is in focus, an image is said to have a long depth of field. For a long depth of field, choose a large f-stop number. When you're shooting in aperture priority mode, you'll set the aperture and the camera will automatically select the correct shutter speed for proper exposure. To use this mode, set the mode dial to A, rotate the command dial to select an aperture value as you watch the display through the viewfinder or on the information display. Once you've made your selection, press the shutter button halfway down to focus and the rest of the way to take the picture. The next advanced shooting mode is the manual or M mode. This mode gives you complete control of the camera. In manual mode, you will set both the shutter speed and aperture to create the exposure. To operate the camera in manual mode, rotate the mode dial to M. To set the shutter speed, rotate the command dial. To set the aperture, press and hold the aperture button while rotating the command dial. Press the shutter button halfway so that as you're making adjustments to the aperture and shutter speed, you can watch the exposure scale either on the LCD monitor or through the viewfinder. When the exposure level indicator is near the center of the scale, the image will be properly exposed. You can choose just the right aperture and shutter speed combination for your scene, whether you want to freeze the action or create a very shallow depth of field. Make the necessary adjustments to the aperture and shutter speed so that the exposure level indicator is near the center of the scale, then press the shutter button halfway down to focus and the rest of the way down to take the picture. In addition to aperture and shutter speed, the camera's ISO setting will have a significant impact on whether your images are properly exposed. The ISO setting affects the image sensor's sensitivity to light. The higher the number, the less light that is required to expose the image sensor. You can either have the camera automatically choose the sensitivity or you can set it manually. Here's how to set the ISO on the D5200. Press the information edit button to enter the information display. Use the multi-selector to navigate to the ISO setting and press OK to select it. Here you can use the multi-selector to choose the ISO setting. Once you have made your selection, press OK to confirm your selection. It's a good idea to set the ISO speed to suit the ambient light setting that you're shooting in. When you increase the ISO speed, a higher number, for low light, a faster shutter speed can be used to avoid blurry images. Keep in mind that a higher ISO setting may introduce noise or grain into your images. An ISO setting that is too high for the shooting conditions will make the image lose quality, and you may even start to see particles in your photo. Experiment with ISO settings to become more familiar with your range and control. Your camera's image sensor is very powerful. It gives you the flexibility to shoot in low light conditions and still get amazing pictures. Here is a guide that will help you have a basic idea of what ISO settings to use in various situations. When you're outdoors in full sun, use ISO 100 to 200. In the shade, on an overcast day, or indoors with lots of window light, use ISO 400. ISOs 800 and higher should be used indoors for action shots or in other low light conditions. Now that we've discussed shooting modes and ISO settings, let's take a minute to talk about the camera's release modes. The release modes determine how many times the shutter releases when you press the shutter button. The D5200 has single frame, continuous low speed, continuous high speed, a 10 second self timer, delayed remote, quick response remote, and quiet. To set the release mode, simply press the release mode button and use the multi-selector to choose the release mode on the LCD monitor. In single frame release mode, one picture will be taken when you press the shutter button completely. This is a good mode for stationary subjects. The continuous low speed release mode will record up to three frames per second when the shutter button is pressed down completely. 
The continuous high speed release mode will record up to five frames per second while the shutter button is held down. The self timer mode takes the picture 10 seconds after the shutter button is pressed completely. Use this mode for self portraits or with a tripod to reduce camera shake at very slow shutter speeds. The next two release modes are for use with an optional remote control. The delayed remote release mode will take the picture two seconds after the remote shutter button is pressed. The quick response remote release mode will take the picture at the exact time the remote shutter button is pressed. The final release mode, the quiet shutter release, is like the single frame release mode, except that it does not beep when focus is achieved. This mode keeps sound to a minimum in quiet surroundings. The Nikon D5200 has two features in addition to the camera shooting modes that you can use to capture great photos and amazing HD video. Let's discuss the camera's live view and movie modes. To shoot in live view or prepare for movie recording, rotate the live view switch to LV. The view will be displayed on the camera's LCD. Please note that it is important to avoid directing the camera's lens toward the sun in live view and movie modes, as this can seriously damage the camera's internal components. Next, you'll need to choose the camera's AF mode as well as the AF area mode. To choose the AF mode, press the Information Edit button to place the cursor in the information display. Then navigate to the Focus Mode options. In Live View, you can choose from AFS or Single Servo AF, AFF or Full Time Servo AF, and Manual Focus. The AFS or Single Servo AF Focus Mode is best suited for stationary subjects. The focus will be locked using the selected focus point when the shutter button is pressed halfway. Use this mode when you're photographing objects or stationary people. The other autofocus mode that is available in live view and movie mode is AFF or full-time servo. This is a great mode to use for moving subjects. Using the selected focus point, the camera will focus continually even without the shutter button being pressed. Focus will be locked when the shutter button is pressed halfway down. After you've selected the autofocus mode, you'll need to choose the autofocus area mode. To do this, press the information edit button to place the cursor in the display. Then navigate to the AF area options. In live view and movie modes, there are four different AF area modes face priority, wide area, normal area, and subject tracking. The AF area modes determine how the camera chooses the focus point or area. For the wide, normal, and subject tracking AF area modes, use the multi-selector to move the focus point to the desired area of the frame. You can press the OK button to quickly place the focus point in the center of the frame. If you select face priority, the camera will automatically find and focus on faces in the frame. Wide area is best suited for photographing landscapes and other non-portrait subjects. Use normal area when you want to pinpoint focus on a specific part of the frame. Using a tripod will help you make sure that focus stays exactly where you want it. This is a great mode to use when you're photographing small subjects. The last AF area mode is subject tracking. This mode is great for moving subjects. You'll need to position the focus point and press the OK button. This will tell the camera to track the subject in the focus point as it moves across the frame. To end subject tracking, press the OK button again. In the default live view screen, several important shooting settings are displayed on the screen. Here, you'll see the metering mode, the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. This is the number of shots remaining. Here is the battery indicator. The battery will be depleted more rapidly in live view, so you'll want to keep an eye on the battery indicator. This icon is the beep indicator. At the top of the screen, you'll see the shooting mode, the flash mode, the focus mode, the AF area mode, the HDR indicator, the active delighting setting, the picture control, the white balance, the image size, the image quality, and the release mode. 
To view the movie indicators display, press the info button. You'll see many of the same icons at the bottom of the display that were shown in the default live view screen. In the movie indicators display, you'll see the sound level indicator, as well as the movie recording time remaining and the movie frame size. Pressing the info button again will show the hide indicators display where many of the icons are hidden. Pressing the info button once more will show the framing grid, which is useful when you want to check for a straight horizon line or for creating striking compositions. To return to the default live view display, press the info button again. Now let's discuss the camera's movie mode capabilities. Your D5200 can record full HD video. When shooting movies, use an SD Speed Class 6 memory card or higher. If a slower memory card is used, the movie may not be properly recorded. While shooting movies or in live view, be sure that you do not point the lens directly into the sun as it may damage the camera's components. Just like capturing still photos, you can set the camera to record video at different resolutions or frame sizes. Each frame size has high or normal quality settings and 24 or 30 frames per second options. Choosing 24 frames per second will closely imitate the look that you would get if you were shooting with film. 30 frames per second is more like what you would see on television. The purpose or use of the finished video will help you decide which frame size and quality setting to use. Keep in mind that the higher the resolution, the larger the file sizes will be. The movie recording options, including frame size and quality, are available in the camera's shooting menu under Movie Settings. The first option, Frame Size, Frame Rate, is where you'll be able to select the frame size and frame rate. Choosing one of the top three options, 1920 by 1080, will allow you to capture full HD video. Use this when you want the highest resolution video the camera is capable of recording. The second resolution option, 1280 by 720, is a good option when you want to have high quality video, but it doesn't need to be full HD. This frame size could be used for family home movies or similar scenarios. The final frame size option is 640 by 424. This option is great for videos that you only intend to post on the internet. The lower resolution makes the file size smaller, making it easier for a video to be shared online. After you've selected the movie frame size and rate, you'll need to choose the movie quality. Choosing the high quality over the normal quality setting will not affect the resolution of your video, but it will allow you to capture smoother motion in action sequences. Recording movies with your D5200 is easy. Use the camera's movie mode. Make sure that the camera is in the live view by rotating the live view switch. Before recording, focus using the methods we have discussed. Press the movie recording button to start recording and press it again to stop recording your movie files will be saved as MOV files. To view a movie that you recorded, press the playback button and scroll to the movie you would like to play. Press the OK button to enter the movie playback. With the D5200, you have the ability to trim movies within the movie playback. At the point that you would like to have your clip start or end, press the down button on the multi-selector to pause the movie. Then press the AEL-AFL button to select the start or end point of your movie clip and use the multi-selector to make your selection. Select OK. The last thing that you'll need to do is delete the extra frames. To do this, simply press the up arrow on the multi-selector. Here you can choose to have the trimmed movie file as the new file or you can overwrite the existing movie file and you can choose cancel or preview. We'll select Save as New File and select OK. Note that selecting Overwrite Existing File will erase the original movie and replace it with the trimmed version. If you find that the recorded movies are too bright or too dark, you can make adjustments to the exposure compensation. To do this, simply press and hold the exposure compensation button while rotating the command dial. To make the image brighter, rotate the command dial to the right. Note that the plus sign of the exposure compensation icon is visible. To make the image darker, rotate the command dial to the left. 
Note that the minus sign of the exposure compensation is visible when the images are made darker. To record sound in the movie mode, the D5200 has a built-in microphone, which will record sound automatically by default. If you'd like to change the microphone sensitivity or turn off sound recording, you can do this through the camera's menu system. In the shooting menu, scroll to the movie settings and select microphone. Here, you can choose auto sensitivity or manual sensitivity. If you choose manual sensitivity, you can choose from values ranging from 1 to 20. The higher the number you choose, the more sensitive the microphone will be to sound. The Nikon D5200 has a large LCD monitor where you can review images, adjust menu settings, and access the information display. There are many options available for previewing images and many of the camera's settings can easily be accessed through the information display. Let's discuss how to use these camera features. For basic playback of your images on the camera's LCD monitor, simply press the playback button. Then you can use the multi-selector to scroll through the images. If you have a large number of images recorded on your memory card, you may find that it's faster to find the photos that you'd like to view if you display multiple photos on the screen at once. To do this, simply press the zoom out button. Pressing the zoom out button once will display four images on the LCD monitor. Pressing the zoom out button twice will display nine images and pressing the zoom out button a third time will display 72 images. From here, you can use the multi-selector to scroll through the images and press the OK button for a full screen display of the image you'd like to view. You can also magnify images on the LCD monitor. This is especially useful when you want to check for good focus in detail areas of the photo. Press the zoom in button once or multiple times to see the desired level of detail in the photo. Then you can use the multi-selector to scroll top to bottom and side to side of the photo. As you're scrolling through the photos in the camera's playback, you may find some images that you'd like to protect from accidentally being erased. To protect an image, simply press the protect button. A small key icon will appear on the LCD to indicate that the image is protected. Simply press the protect button again to unprotect the image. If you find a photo that didn't turn out, you can delete it from the memory card by pressing the delete button. When the dialog appears, press the delete button again and the image will be removed from the memory card. Note that once an image is deleted, it cannot be recovered. There are several different playback screens and options on the D5200. By default, not all of the screen options are enabled. To enable the other screen options, press the menu button and navigate to the playback menu. Select playback display options. Here you can use the right arrow on the multi-selector to select each of the options to be enabled. When you're finished, press OK. Let's take a look at the first and default playback screen. This screen shows some important information about the image. First, there is the folder name, the file name, the image quality and size settings, and the date and time that the image was recorded. At the top right corner of the screen, the frame number out of the total number of images is displayed. To view additional playback displays, press the up and down arrow button on the multi-selector. Pressing the up arrow will display the overview playback display. In addition to the information that was shown in the default or file information playback display, there is a histogram of the image. The histogram gives a basic idea of the tone distribution of an image. If the histogram is shifted to the left side of the graph, the image will probably be dark or underexposed. If the histogram is shifted to the right side of the graph, the image will be too bright or overexposed. In most cases, a properly exposed photo will have data distributed over the whole graph. The histogram will help you have a basic idea of the overall exposure of your image when you're outdoors in bright sunlight and the photos are difficult to see on the LCD monitor. This screen also shows the metering mode, the shooting mode, the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO setting, the focal length, the exposure compensation and flash compensation settings, the white balance setting, the color space, the picture control, and the active delighting setting. 
Pressing the up arrow again will display the first screen of the shooting data display. There are three screens in this display. Press the up arrow on the multi-selector to view the additional screens. The next playback display is the RGB histogram display. This screen shows a histogram for the whole image as well as a histogram for each of the red, green, and blue channels of the image. Here you can see the areas of any of the individual channels that are shifted to the left showing the dark tones in that channel or shifted to the right showing the lighter tones in that color channel. If any of the channels have distribution that is shifted too far to the right, that color channel will be oversaturated and show little or no detail. The last screen available in the playback display is blinking highlights. This feature is useful for times when you may want to have the camera warn you if certain areas of your photo are overexposed. In this playback display, areas that are very overexposed and have lost detail in highlights will blink in black. In the playback mode, there are several useful and creative ways that you can process your images in camera. These are the retouch menu options and are accessed in the playback mode by pressing the OK button. Let's discuss several of these options now. The first item in this menu is D-Lighting, which allows you to improve detail in highlight and shadow areas in an image. First, you'll need to select the amount of correction you'd like to apply. On the right side of the screen, a preview image is displayed as you scroll through the options. Choosing low will improve some of the darkest shadow areas, normal will brighten more of the shadow areas, and high will brighten most of the shadow areas in the image. After you have made your selection, press OK to save the image. The camera will make a copy of the image and save it to the memory card. Retouched images have the retouch icon displayed on the top of the image. The red eye correction feature will allow you to reduce the effect of red eye in images where the flash was used. Another useful feature is trim, where you can crop a photo in camera. Using the camera zoom in and zoom out buttons, you can adjust the size of the crop and rotating the command dial will allow you to change the aspect ratio. You can also use the multi-selector to move the crop to your desired area of the frame. Finally, you can press OK to apply the crop to save the image as a separate file. Although photo editing software makes it fast and easy to, to convert your images to black and white, your camera will do a great job with this task as well with the monochrome menu option. You can choose from black and white, sepia or brown tone, and cyanotype or blue tone. With both sepia and cyanotype, you can adjust the intensity of the color with the multi-selectors up and down arrows. In the filter effects section of the retouch menu, you can choose to apply one of seven filters to your image. The skylight filter will reduce the blue in the image. The warm filter will give the photo a warm red cast. The red, green, and blue intensifiers will enhance or intensify that specific color in the image. You can use the multi-selectors up and down arrow keys to increase or decrease the effect. The cross screen filter is a way to create starburst effects for the light sources in the image. There are several options with this filter. First, you can choose the number of points you'd like each starburst to have. Then you can choose the amount or the brightness of the light sources that will be affected. You'll also need to choose the angle and length of the filter points. After your selections have been made, you can select Confirm to see the effects of your changes. From here, you can make adjustments or you can select Save to have a copy saved to the memory card. The last filter in Filter Effects is the Soft Filter, which will apply a soft photo effect to the image. You can use the multi-selector to choose the amount of softness that is applied and press OK to save a copy of the image. You can use the color balance feature to adjust the overall color of the image. Use the multi-selector to place the indicator in the area of the color grid that you'd like and press OK to save a copy of the image. The D5200's NEF or RAW processing will make a JPEG copy of a RAW file and save it to the memory card. Here you can adjust several items, image quality and size, white balance, 
exposure compensation, picture control, high ISO noise reduction, color space, vignette control, and active V lighting. After you've made the desired adjustments to each of these settings, highlight EXE and press OK to make a JPEG copy of the image. Another useful function in the retouch menu is the resize option, where you can create smaller copies of images. First, you'll want to choose the size of the image copy. Options ranging between 2.5 megapixels and 0.1 megapixels are available. Select the size you want and press OK. Select Yes and select OK again to save a resized copy to your memory card. The camera's quick retouch option will create a copy of the selected image with greater contrast and enhanced colors. The straighten function can be used for any image but is especially helpful for landscapes and photos of architecture. Using this function is simple. Using the left and right arrow buttons on the multi-selector, align the horizon or any other reference line with the displayed grid. When you have adjusted the photo to your liking, press the OK button to have the camera save a copy of the image. Depending on the lens and the focal length that you use, you may find that some of your images have some distortion, a sometimes unwanted effect where the photo appears to be either bloated or pinched. The D5200 has a feature to help correct distortion. To use it, select Distortion Control in the Retouch menu, choose Auto to have the camera automatically correct distortion, and you'll only need to fine-tune with the multi-selector. If you'd like to have complete control over the distortion control, select Manual. Use the multi-selector to adjust the distortion control to your liking and press OK to have the camera save a copy of the image. If you don't own a fisheye lens but you like that effect, you can recreate it with the fisheye feature in the retouch menu. Simply select fisheye and use the left and right arrows on the multi-selector to choose how much fisheye distortion you'd like to apply and press OK to save a copy of the image. The Color Outline and Color Sketch options will allow you to create interesting and artistic effects with your photos. Similar to Distortion Control, the Perspective Control feature will help you to reduce the distortion that is often caused when photos of architecture are taken from a low viewpoint. You can use the up, down, left, and right arrows on the multi-selector to make adjustments to the perspective distortion. Again, simply press OK to save a copy of the adjusted image. The miniature effect will allow you to create images with similar effects to photos that are commonly created with tilt-shift lenses. Use the sides of the multi-selector to choose the size of the field of focus and use the top and bottom of the multi-selector to choose the area of focus. You can press the zoom out button to change the direction of the field of focus. To see a preview of the effect, press and hold the zoom in button. When you're satisfied with the changes, press the OK button to save the image to the memory card. The selective color effect allows you to create photos that have only selected colors in an image that is otherwise black and white. Use the multi-selector to find the area of color you'd like to select and press the AEL-AFL button to select it. Then you can rotate the command dial to select up to two additional colors in the same way. When you've selected the colors that you'd like to be visible in the image, press OK to save a copy to the memory card. The side-by-side -side comparison option will allow you to view the original image side-by-side -side with the edited copies. If you have created multiple edited copies, you can use the multi-selector to highlight the image on the right and then use the top and bottom of the multi-selector to scroll through the edited copies. Let's discuss the focus modes that are available on the D5200. When you're choosing the focus mode, the main thing that you'll want to think about is whether or not the subject is in motion. The Nikon D5200 has a sophisticated autofocus system with a variety of autofocus modes and areas that when used well together will help you get great focus regardless of what type of subject you're photographing. Understanding how all of the modes and areas work together might seem a little confusing, 
but this chapter of the guide will help you know when to use each autofocus mode as well as autofocus area mode. To choose an autofocus mode on the D5200, press the information edit button and use the multi selector to select the focus mode setting. There are four different options AFA or auto servo AF, AFS or single servo AF, AFC or continuous servo AF, and MF or manual focus. AFS or single servo AF is intended for use with stationary subjects. In this mode, the focus is locked when the shutter button is pressed halfway. This would be a good mode to choose if you're photographing products or you're doing portrait work with an older child or adult. AFC or continuous servo autofocus is a good mode to choose if you're photographing moving subjects. In this mode, the camera will focus continuously while the shutter button is pressed halfway. This mode is great if you're photographing a sporting event small children or animals. In AFA or Auto Servo AF, the camera will begin focus using the Single Servo AF mode and if the still subject starts moving, the camera will automatically switch to the Continuous Servo focus mode. Before we begin discussing the autofocus area modes, please note that autofocus modes and autofocus area modes are different settings but function together. Understanding how they work together will help your images have great focus. To choose the AF area modes, press the information edit button and navigate to the AF area mode option. You can choose from single point AF, nine point dynamic area AF, 21 point dynamic area AF, 39-point dynamic area AF, 3D tracking, and auto area AF. The first auto focus area mode is single point AF. In this auto focus area mode, you will manually select the exact focus point that you'd like the camera to use for focus. This auto focus area mode is great for stationary subjects. Once you've selected single point AF for autofocus area mode, it's easy to select the focus point using the camera's multi-selector. You can see the focus point that is selected in both the viewfinder and the information display on the LCD monitor. The camera will focus only on the subject that is in the selected focus point. If you want to quickly set the focus point back on the center point, simply press the OK button. The next autofocus area modes are the dynamic area AF modes. These modes are not available in the camera's single servo AF focus mode. When you're using one of these modes, the initial focus point is selected manually, just like in the single point AF mode. In dynamic mode, the areas or focus points surrounding the one that you select will be used as backup. This means that if the subject briefly leaves the selected point, the camera will focus based on the information from the surrounding focus points. The dynamic area AF modes are great for subjects that generally move in one direction within the frame. In dynamic area AF, you can choose from 9, 21, or 39 point. You'll want to choose the number of dynamic area AF points based on the predictability of the moving subject. The more predictable the subject is, the less AF points you'll need. For subjects that are somewhat predictable in their movement, you could use the 9-point dynamic area AF. And for subjects that are not at all predictable, you'll want to use the 39-point dynamic area AF. With 3D tracking, focus can be maintained for subjects that quickly move not only side to side, but also forward and backward within the frame. Examples of these types of subjects would be figure skaters or rodeo participants. Note that 3D tracking is not available in the camera's single servo AF mode. In auto area AF, the camera will automatically find the subject and choose the appropriate focus point or points to use. This autofocus area mode is available for use in both autofocus modes. Auto area AF is great for snapshots or for situations when you don't have time to select the focus point manually. However, keep in mind that in auto area AF mode, the camera may occasionally choose to focus on a subject other than what you had intended.
Now that we've discussed the camera's autofocus modes and autofocus area modes separately, let's talk about how the autofocus functions could work together in specific shooting scenarios. First, let's use a sporting event, for example, a football game. Subjects in this type of scenario will be in motion, so you'll want to select AFC or Continuous Servo AF mode. If Single Servo AF was chosen, the camera would not continue to focus on the subject as the shutter button was pressed halfway down. After the autofocus mode is set to AFC, either Dynamic Area or 3D Tracking would be a good choice for the autofocus area mode. The speed and predictability of the subjects would determine whether dynamic area or 3D tracking would be the better choice. If the action is somewhat predictable and the motion is generally from side to side, using the dynamic area AF would get good results. If the action is more erratic and the motion is not only side to side but forward and backward as well, 3D tracking would be a good option. So when you're at a sporting event like a football game, you'll probably want to choose Continuous Servo AF for your focus mode. And depending on the level of action in the game, either Dynamic Area or 3D Tracking for the AF Area mode. Now let's discuss a portrait scenario. Assuming that you're photographing an older child or adult, the subject will be stationary. So a good AF mode to use would be Single Servo AF. For the autofocus area mode, you could choose the auto area AF or the single point AF. For older subjects with less motion, the single point AF would be the best way to assure the focus was exactly where you intended it to be. But if the subject was a younger child, there may not be time to select the individual focus point, so the auto servo AF might be a better option. When you're doing portrait work on an older child or adult, Using single servo AF combined with single point AF will give you the most accurate results. When you're photographing younger children, you may want to use auto servo AF combined with the auto area AF to get good focus. The last of the focus modes is the manual focus or MF mode. This gives you the control to manually focus on any subject throughout the viewfinder using the focus ring. Sometimes a photo may have poor focus, but it's not related to the camera's focus mode or focus area mode. Camera shake happens when the camera moves while the shutter is open, exposing the image sensor. Always try to steady the camera. Holding it with two hands and pressing the viewfinder gently against your face will help. You can also lean against something or use a tripod, a monopod, or even a beanbag to steady your camera. You can also reduce the effect of camera shake by selecting a fast shutter speed. This reduces the amount of time the image sensor is exposed to shaky conditions. A helpful rule of thumb is to set your shutter speed to one over the focal length. Confusing? Let me explain. If the focal length on your lens is 300 millimeters, for example, you should set your shutter speed to at least 1 300th of a second. If the focal length is 30 millimeters, you might get by by using a shutter speed as low as 1 30th of a second. Let's take a look at the d 5200 sophisticated menu system. To access the menu, simply press the menu button. There are five different menus, including the playback, shooting, custom setting, setup, retouch, and recent settings menus. Many of these settings are discussed in greater detail in other chapters of this guide. We'll just look at an overview of the menu items in this chapter. Let's first take a look at each of the items in the playback menu. First, there is the delete option. Here you can choose to delete a selected group of images. Delete images by the date they were taken, or you can delete all of the images. The next playback menu item is the playback folder. Here you can select which folder of images you'd like to be viewed in playback mode. The next option is the playback display options folder. This is where you can choose which playback display options you'd like to be enabled. You can select whether or not you'd like to have the focus point that was used shown in image playback. You can choose to enable or disable the image only option, blinking highlights, RGB histogram, the shooting data, 
and the overview playback displays. The next option allows you to turn the image review on or off. With the rotate tall option, you can choose to have images that were taken with a vertical orientation automatically rotate for viewing in the playback screen. The next option is the slideshow, where you can create a slideshow of the images for playback on the camera's LCD or television when the camera is connected with a compatible cable. The DPOF print order option will allow you to choose the order that images are printed directly from the camera when you're using a compatible printer. The next menu item is the shooting menu. The first option is reset shooting menu, which will allow you to reset the shooting menu settings to factory default. Next, there is the storage folder option, which will allow you to select the folder where your files are saved. The next two options are the image quality and size options. The next two options are white balance and set picture control, which will allow you to choose the white balance and picture control settings. Manage picture control will allow you to adjust, edit, and save custom picture controls. Next, there is the auto distortion control option. When enabled, this option will automatically correct the distortion that is caused by certain lenses. Next, there is the color space option. Your camera has two color space options. Some photographers prefer the sRGB mode as it requires less processing later. Other photographers prefer the Adobe RGB mode as this mode has a wider range of colors making it a preferred option for images that will be extensively processed on the computer. The active delighting option is next. Active delighting helps preserve highlight and shadow areas, making images look more natural. Overall, active delighting is a great way to improve your photos in camera. The next option is HDR, or High Dynamic Range. When enabled, the camera will capture two images at different exposures and combine them to create an image with a super realistic range of shadows and highlights. You can select one of five different HDR settings. The next two options, Long Exposure Noise Reduction and High ISO Noise Reduction, will allow you to enable noise reduction for long exposures as well as set a level of noise reduction for images taken at high ISO settings. ISO sensitivity settings is where you can select the ISO as well as the auto ISO controls. Next, there is the release mode options where you can select the release mode. With the multiple exposure option, you can set up the camera to take multiple exposure photos. You can set the mode, number of shots, and the auto gain. Next, there is the interval timer shooting option. With this feature, you can set the camera to take photos at preset time intervals, which can be minutes or hours. The last menu item is the movie settings option, where you can choose the movie frame size, quality, and microphone settings. The next menu is the custom setting menu where you can access a variety of settings for autofocus, exposure, timers, AE lock, shooting display, bracketing flash, and controls. The next menu item is the setup menu. The format memory card option is first, followed by the monitor brightness option, which will allow you to adjust the brightness of the monitor. Information display format will allow you to customize the appearance of the information display. You can choose from a variety of options for the basic and advanced shooting modes. The next option, auto information display, will allow you to choose whether the information display is activated when the shutter button is pressed halfway. The clean image sensor option will allow you to choose at what times you'd like the image sensor to be cleaned. Next, there is the lock mirror up for cleaning option. Note that the battery must be fully charged to use this option. Image dust off reference photo is next. With this option, you can take a photo to be used in conjunction with Nikon's Capture NX2 software to remove dust spots automatically from photos when post-processing. The video mode option will allow you to choose the video standard for movie recording. If you're in the United States, you'll want to select NTSC. 
the HDMI option is where you can choose the resolution to be used when your camera is connected to an HD television. And the flicker reduction is used when you're using live view or movie mode under fluorescent or mercury vapor lights. You'll want the setting to match the local AC power supply. The next options allow you to set the time and date and language for the menu system and displays. Image comment will allow you to input a comment up to 36 characters on an image. Next, there is auto image rotation. When enabled, auto image rotation will automatically rotate vertical images for easier playback. The next option, accessory terminal, will allow you to select the role of the accessory terminal. You can choose from options for taking photos, recording movies, and for using an optional GPS unit. The next option, wireless mobile adapter, will allow you to choose whether the camera will establish a wireless connection with smart devices when an optional wireless mobile adapter is used. The last menu item in the setup menu is firmware version, which will display the firmware version that is currently in use. The next menu item is the retouch menu. Each of these menu items are discussed in detail in Chapter 5. The final menu is the recent settings menu, which will display the most recently accessed menu items. Let's discuss white balance. It's important to understand that the quality of your pictures is affected by the color of the surrounding light and how the camera's electronics process that light. Compensating for varying light conditions is referred to as setting the white balance. Most light looks white to an untrained eye, but it can be composed of a range of different colors. The color of sunlight is different in daylight, in shade, or in cloudy conditions. Daylight, for example, is fairly blue, and fluorescent light is fairly green. If your camera is set to shoot in daylight, but you're shooting in a setting with fluorescent light, your image will look overly red. Proper camera white balance takes into account the color temperature of a light source, which refers to the relative warmth or coolness of white light. Human eyes are very good at judging what is white under different light sources. However, digital cameras have difficulty determining auto white balance. Incorrect white balance can create unattractive blue, orange, or even green colors in your photos. The white balance scale is expressed in measurements of Kelvin. The higher color temperatures measured in areas of 5600 Kelvin to 7500 Kelvin represent situations like a sunlit or cloudy day. These shooting situations have a greater amount of blue tones and a lesser amount of red tones. Lower color temperature situations are measured in the area of 3500 Kelvin down to 1900 Kelvin and are found in lighting situations like standard lighting from a tungsten light bulb or candle light. These types of shooting situations are found on the lower end of the spectrum and produce a greater amount of red tones and a lesser amount of blue tones. Once you get acquainted with the camera's white balance settings, you can try setting your own by using the camera's custom white balance feature. To use this tool effectively, you'll want to be familiar with the color temperature that is most effective for your shooting situation. Again, most light looks white to an untrained eye. Setting your white balance will help your pictures have the proper coloring. If natural colors cannot be obtained using the auto white balance, you can select one of the other white balance settings to suit the respective light source. To select a white balance setting, press the Information Edit button and navigate to the white balance option. Here you can select one of eight different options. The first option is auto white balance. With this option, the camera will attempt to automatically adjust the color temperature. The next white balance setting is incandescent. This is a good setting to use when taking pictures under common light bulbs. It reduces the reddish tones in a picture. This setting is marked with a light bulb icon. The fluorescent lighting setting is great for taking pictures under fluorescent lighting. With the D5200, you can choose one of seven different fluorescent white balance options depending on the type of fluorescent light you're shooting under. The next white balance setting is direct sunlight. Direct sunlight is a great setting for taking pictures in the sunlight. This setting is marked with a sun icon. The next setting is the flash setting. Use this setting when using the built-in or an external flash unit. 
The next setting is cloudy. Use this setting when taking pictures on days that are overcast. Use the shade setting when you're taking pictures in the shade. It reduces the bluish tones in a picture. The last option is preset manual. With this setting, you can create a custom white balance for your specific lighting conditions. Setting a custom white balance will ensure the best accuracy for the white balance in your images. To set a preset manual white balance, enter the camera shooting menu and select white balance. Here, highlight preset manual and press the right arrow on the multi-selector. Select measure and OK. If the camera prompts you with an overwrite existing data dialog, select yes and press OK. Now, fill the viewfinder with the white object and take a picture. If the white balance measurement was successful, data acquired will appear on the information display. Otherwise, the camera will prompt you that it was unable to measure the white balance and you'll need to begin the custom white balance process again. The other method for setting a preset manual white balance is the use photo method. And it's done by selecting an existing image on the memory card for the camera to copy the white balance data from. To set a preset manual white balance from the photo on the memory card, first make sure that the white balance is set to preset manual and then navigate to the white balance option in the shooting menu. Scroll to preset manual and press the right side of the multi-selector. Highlight select image and press the right side of the multi-selector. Now you can select this image which will use the image displayed on the LCD or you can choose select image which will allow you to choose any image on the memory card. When you're finished, simply press OK. In addition to white balance, there are two other features on your D5200 that can improve the quality of your images. Picture controls and active D-lighting. Let's talk about the picture controls. This feature will allow you to customize the look of your image. There are six picture controls, including standard, neutral, vivid, monochrome, portrait, and landscape. The picture controls on the D5200 are easily accessed in the information display. The standard picture control is the default setting, and it offers standard processing and balanced results. This is a good picture control for general situations. The neutral picture control is a good setting to choose if you wish to process your images with your computer. Colors in this picture style are natural and subdued. The vivid picture control is great for images with primary colors that you'd like emphasized. The monochrome picture control is useful when you'd like to take black and white photographs. Note, images taken in this setting cannot be converted to color later. The portrait picture control is great for portraits. It offers pleasant skin tones and textures. The landscape picture control is good for taking pictures of scenery or cities outdoors. Let's modify a picture control. To do this, we'll need to enter the camera shooting menu. Here, we'll highlight set picture control and we'll press the right arrow on the multi-selector. Now, we'll need to select a picture control to modify. We'll choose vivid. To make modifications, press the right arrow on the multi-selector. Settings can be adjusted using the arrows on the multi-selector. To make the color on the vivid picture control a little more saturated, select saturation and use the multi-selector to choose a value toward the plus side of the scale. Press OK to save changes. Picture controls that have been modified are shown with an asterisk on the picture control menu. The D5200 also has a feature called active D-lighting. When enabled, this feature will preserve detail in the shadow and highlight areas of images with high contrast. This feature is most effective when it's used with matrix metering mode. To use active D-lighting, press the information edit button, scroll to active D-lighting and press OK. Here you can choose from auto, extra high, high, normal, low and off. Note that the higher the setting, the more digital noise may be introduced into the shadow areas of your image. Your D5200 has a powerful built-in flash that can provide you with extra light in certain shooting scenarios. 
The effective range of the built-in flash is between 2 and 30 feet, depending on the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. As a general rule, you'll want to keep your subject within about 3.5 to 20 feet for the best results. To use the built-in flash, simply press the flash pop-up button and the flash will pop up. To select the flash mode, press and hold the flash mode button while rotating the command dial. The first flash mode is fill flash. This mode is a good general use flash mode. The camera will calculate how much light is needed and the flash will provide that light. The next flash mode is red eye reduction. This mode is good when you're photographing people or pets. In this mode, a tiny pre-flash will fire, which causes the size of the person's pupils to shrink, lessening the effect of red eye in the photo. Because the photo is not taken immediately when the shutter button is pressed, you'll want to avoid using this mode with moving subjects. The third flash mode is red eye reduction with slow sync. In this mode, the flash will combine with the red eye reduction function with the slow sync mode. Use this mode for night portraits when you'd like the background to be properly exposed and you'd like to minimize the effects of red eyes. This mode is available only when the shooting mode is set to programmed auto or aperture priority. It's a good idea to use a tripod in this mode to minimize blur due to camera shake. The next flash mode is slow sync mode. This flash mode is a good mode to use when you're photographing a subject at night and you'd like to have the background and the subject properly exposed. This mode is also available only when shooting is set to programmed auto or aperture priority and you may want to use a tripod when you're using this mode as well. The last flash mode is rear curtain plus slow sync. In this mode, the flash fires just before the shutter closes which will create a stream of light behind light sources. The subject will be properly exposed. Using a tripod is recommended to minimize blur due to camera shake. You may find that the flash is producing too much or too little light for your images. Using the flash compensation will allow you to make adjustments to the overall brightness of the image when your flash is used. To adjust the flash compensation, press the Information Edit button and select Flash Compensation. Here you can use the Multi Selector to adjust the flash compensation. You can choose values with a plus sign to make the image brighter and values with a minus sign to make the image darker. We hope you've enjoyed learning more about your Nikon D5200. We know this new information will give you enough confidence and know-how to get the most out of your camera. Remember, you can refer back to any section of this guide at any time. Just select the topics you want to review from the main menu or table of contents. Watch for more Quick Pro guides on newly released cameras. Thanks for watching.